Well, good afternoon, everyone, or wherever you are joining, whatever time of the day, good day. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I hope that that sun as it rose in the east is shining upon you wherever you are. And even if the clouds are covering that sun, I hope that there's some sort of sunshine in your day. You know, even on those cloudiest and darkest days, there's always sun, there's always gifts, there's always um, beauty that is around us. So we give thanks to Creator. So welcome, welcome. My name is Michelle. Um, joining us this afternoon is Barry Stevens. We're super honored to have him with us. You've joined Innovate BC. I am joining from Amiskwichi, Waskaigan, Edmonton Treaty 6 territory. I really believe it's important, you know, just to take a moment to acknowledge the land in which you live on, acknowledge the original peoples and the history. That's, you know, one step towards reconciliation. Uh, Barry is in one of my favorite parts of Canada, Nova Scotia. Uh, I'm super excited. He was just saying he came out from being outdoors, I think was it near the waters, Barry. Um, beautiful land out there. So we welcome you to our virtual community. We're excited to hear what you have to share. So I'm going I'm, I'm honored to introduce this gentleman. So he is the president of Stephen Solutions and Designed Incorporated. Um, so he's going to talk about today this 3D wave design, the software, this technology, which is fantastic. Like I sat through his presentation, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe, maybe a month ago, and I was just fascinated what, by what he has designed. So here's an introduction to him. He's a Mi'kmaq Acadia First Nation community member. He has held positions in both management and engineering roles in advanced development laboratories, anti-submarine warfare product design, woo, HF communications, business development and consulting, training, product sales, and product management. At his last place of employment, he was VP of operations. In 2001, Barry launched Stevens Solutions and Design Incorporated and has supplied communications and custom electronic hardware design software solutions for use in corporate communications, instructions and e-learning, security, defense, government agencies, global corporations, nonprofits, <laughs> and indigenous organizations. So this guy has been around. He's bringing some really good knowledge he's no he knows what he's talking about and also he, he's going to share some simulations um you know we think of this summer and even now for, for sure in bc all of those wildfires um and then the potential of flooding um so you know these kind of environment disasters that happen amongst us so he's going to walk us through some of the software um, and do some simulation so we can see what this software does do and I, it is a fascinating so we're here to hear you speak Barry we welcome you to this virtual stage and I'm going to just say take it away oh well first of all thank you for that grand introduction it sounds a lot more important or exciting than it really is However, I think the ray of sunshine is not the ones that are that you've described across Canada, but perhaps maybe you, because because <laughs> every time I hear you talk, you 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 put a light in, in, in my heart. You're 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 such a pleasant person. So um, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to in, um, welcome everybody to Mi'kma'wi. As as mentioned, I'm a Mi'kmaq. I'm a member of Acadia First Nation. My family is from the Gold River Reserve, which is not far from where I'm at right now. I, I do live off a reserve, but uh, on my way back from the meeting, I mentioned that out on the boats there, I stopped in the reserve and gassed up. And so I rushed here and I'm, I'm very excited to share with you some of the things that we have done, or my son and I, my son and I work hand in hand and I'll give you a little bit of background then I'll get into why you're here so you can see some of the tools we've created from a First Nation perspective for the use for First Nation communities. So if I could perhaps um, share my screen and I wanna try that and I'm going to do that now and uh, I'm gonna go full, uh, full screen here. Can you see all of that? Okay, awesome. So 
Um, as mentioned, my background is in electronic uh, design. I've designed all kinds of different electronic devices that have been used across North America and, and throughout the world. Uh, but that's in the past. I'm working currently working with my son, and he is a programmer and a 3D animator and a filmmaker. And so I, him and I started working and doing technical animations. So um, while doing that, we were doing advanced concepts to basically let people see things in machines or, or inside systems that couldn't be seen. So we used uh, realistic 3D animations. So while working with our First Nation, we were recording some um, uh, some of the elders' traditional knowledge uh, around climate change and, and, and uh, severe climate events. And then we found out one of the reserve lands of my First Nation, we were building houses, which was obviously was on a floodplain. So I asked the elders, this is a floodplain, right? And they said, yes, well, why are we doing this? We're running out of land and it's a place that we can build. And, and I just said, oh my God, this is, you know, well, uh, indigenous services will fix it they'll maintain it uh, um, so it's not right but so I went back and I studied uh, how floodplain mapping is done and I saw the way I saw it it wasn't shared properly so I, I know I'm on the screen and I'm going to go to next but there's how we got into communicating climate risk through 3D interactive mapping so um, the company that I've been running now for about 20 years, and it's a small uh, mom and pop, or I should say uh, pop and sun shop now, uh, we rebranded ourselves for our, our software for three, call it 3D wave design, but we, we took, a, 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 I'll say, an applied science approach with, with also a traditional knowledge and, and the, the desire to share information uh, to, throughout our community. So we, we, we look at making complex information accessible and engaging. And so we're using the latest technology and we're bringing it in so we can, we can have it as a community sharing tool. So without further ado, I'll jump into this. So this is, we just, uh, this is a slideshow from one of the uh, one of our partners uh, that they go out to different communities, non-indigenous communities, but they they educate people through, with our software on on some of the risks. And obviously, in a lot of our communities, uh, for example, this summer again in BC, fire. So we've we've also um, with our modeling, we we look at different uh, climate change risks, including um, uh, river flooding, a sea level rise, storm surge. And we're working hand in hand with the Nat uh, Natural Resources Canada and the Canadian Forestry Service uh, with fire modeling. And I'll show you some of that later on. So most, most people are in, in agreement that we do have climate change. Uh, flooding is something that we're seeing everywhere. I guess uh, I may be dating this video by talking about the storm that hit Louisiana uh, here in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it, uh, it did a lot of damage, uh, it, but we have this all across Canada. So, uh, and it's all across the world. Uh, there, uh, it's, it is truly global climate change. It, whether you're in Southeast Asia or in Europe or North America, we're all seeing extreme weather. So now one of the things that we decided, okay, People are writing reports and scientists are doing a lot of work, but not a lot's happening with that. And so what, what we said, people are hearing that there's climate change, but they're not understanding. So we, we came at this. So we said, we have to give our communities and, and people that have the, the power to, uh, to make change and, and adapt, we have to give them the tools they need to make these decisions. So with, uh, with our technical backgrounds, my son and I, we said, we have to show people in, a, in, a, in an environment that they understand how to prepare for wildfires, river flooding, fluvial flooding, sea level rise, storm surge, and coastal erosion. So in the background here, you see some of these things where you're talking about all of this, but there's one of our early uh, modelings that we did. Um, so to the next. So to give you an idea that this is, uh, that we put a lot of time and energy into this, I've got a screen here in which we, it details some of the uh, research and development and the support we've had. Now, this is somewhat dated, but we, we work with the National Research Council of Canada, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, which is called NSERC, uh, the Applied Geomatics Research Group here in Nova Scotia, uh, the 
Uh, we've had support from the uh, uh, COA, which is the Atlantic uh, Canada Opportunities Agency, and Unawig Development Corp, which is one of our organizations for financial support and business development in our Mi'kmaq communities. Uh, we've worked with, oh, oops, sorry, <laughs> Indigenous services. We've supplied uh, uh, through the emergency management, uh, applied per, uh, emergency management uh, assistance program. We've supplied uh, things for EMO departments, uh, rural innovation district. We did things for the town of Mahone Bay and Lunenburg, Bucking Cake First Nations for aquaculture uh, through indigenous consultants, uh, the Midway, Pond Hook and Wildcat Reserve. So we've been, uh, we've been delivering a little bit of product. So this is very, very new, but it's catching on very quickly. So I'll go to uh, any questions before I go to the next screen. I see Michelle smiling. <laughs> well, I'll keep talking. I was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. <laughs> so um, what we have here, solutions. How do we get people to understand and to adapt and, and, to, and to fix this problem? Well, the climate change, the, I believe it, it, it's, it's here with us and we have to learn to adapt. So we have to understand. So we came, um, so we came at this at a different perspective. Currently, what's happening is uh, LIDAR is gathered and, and basically a plane will fly over or a drone and it will collect uh, uh, laser measurements for to create elevation models and it will take pictures of uh, detailed pictures of communities or landscape or woodland areas or, or towns. And, but it creates humongous data files. And so only scientists and government people can work with it. And we said, no, we've got to change that. So we came up with our own software that takes this huge data set of LIDAR digital elevation models, and we've condensed it while maintaining the digital accuracy so it could be used in a web browser or an executable on a laptop. So, and, and we decided to do this all in 3D because people see and live in a 3D environment. And so we needed to show people, for example, if a river's going to flood, is it going to affect my house? Is it going to affect my band office? Will my car flood? Existing maps are like color coded and they don't convey risk. We can show you risk. Okay. So we also said it has to work on anybody's computer. So we came at this that it has to be efficient and effective. And so it can be this, we designed this from the ground up so it can be used on a smartphone or a tablet. It can be used on the internet. And if you don't have internet, you can have it on, uh, loaded on your laptop. So if in, you're in a remote uh, community or the power goes out or the internet goes down, you still have access to run emergency management scenarios or land use planning or whatever you choose to do. So seeing is believing. So I'm doing a lot of talking about nothing. Soon I'll have to show you something. <laughs> so I think I've sort of touched on this. One of the things that we find is when people go and use our software and it's in their communities and they can raise the water level or set a fire and they can see their houses and their communities being affected, it's personal. And so all of a sudden people want to be able to do something. It's not an abstract concept now. It's like, this, is, this could happen to me, this could happen to my family. So we, once again, we came at this. So it's a sharing and I'll show you that when we deal with communities, we ask for information to incorporate so people can share, like whether there be photographs uh, video information, audio files from elders or written documents or whatever. When we create this model, we customize it for every community so it meets the, the needs. So I'll go to the next screen. So the, um, I think the last time we tried this, we didn't have uh, uh, sound on the video. So could you weigh in and should I even do that? What do you think, Michelle? Okay, I'll play the video. So you're going to suffer. Um, I won't have sound, I don't think, but it will it'll give you an overview. And I'll probably have to uh, stop sharing this screen and share another one. So I'm going to reshare. So I'm back. Okay, promo, share. So I'm going to play the video. Unfortunately, it doesn't have sound, but if you're interested in hearing this uh, or seeing this, it is on our website. And I'll sh at the end of this, I'll show you our web link for our website. So here we go. Bear with me.
This is our local city here in Nova Scotia. It's Halifax. That's all us. That's not Google Earth. That is the model we created from that LiDAR information. That's us playing with the uh, sea level rise. This is one of the communities uh, that I was referring to earlier. Another uh, Acadia First Nation community. Our, our early fire simulation. We can uh, oh, put it in virtual reality. So there's our website if you want to go and see and uh, get more details, but I'm going to hit uh, stop share and I'm going to go back because I think the last time I, the video played <laughs> in the background, it auto played. So I'm going to stop that right now. Okay, so I, I'm probably not sharing my screen, but I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to escape that. Bear with me. You think I'd have this figured out by now. So share screen, <laughs> back on this, share, here we go. And again, full screen mode. So we saw the video. Now the video sort of give an overview. It showed uh, people actually training emergency management, some fire, um, some fire officials and things like that. But I'll go to the next screen. So real world demos. Now, I have a number in here. I'd like to, I know that most people in BC are probably concerned about fire. I'm going to show a, um, a model that we use for the town of, of Lunenburg that's very, very fascinating. It, uh, the town has used it. Uh, and are, are we seeing uh, it? the map loading now? Can you, can you tell me, do, do I need to, I need to change my screen sharing, don't I? Yeah, it's not loading on. Our okay. So I need to somehow I'm getting, okay. So sorry about that. So stop sharing, share screen. <laughs> and we're back on, tell me we are. Are you seeing anything? Okay, awesome. Yes. Okay, uh, for some reason, this isn't filling up my entire screen on my computer. And I, I don't know why, but we'll go with that. So um, this particular map, I'm gonna reload it again. Look in the background. We actually build this, uh, it's sort of a technical thing. Uh, some of your IT people, if they see this, would might be impressed, but I'm gonna show you. As we reload that, we're not downloading that. We're actually building that in, in the browser, which makes it very effective. We're, we put on a, a big area there. So I'm gonna go through these, through the, the, the map uh, introduction. You don't normally have to do this, but we talk about the map and how it was developed, but we're gonna talk about here, if you see my cursor, about 10, 50 and 100 year flood events. And we're gonna talk about a long-term uh, also sea level rise. And uh, this is one of the projects that we did with one of our partners. So, um, uh, we had funding uh, uh, through RBC and the Toronto Dominion Bank, 
And now I'm using a, a, a mouse with a, a wheeled mouse, but this is designed to work on a phone. So you can use your touch screen or on your tablet. So whenever I say I'm zooming in, I'm using a mouse and, and, and the like. So down in here, if you can see my mouse here, there's water level sliders. Uh, we can play with the tide. We can play with the storm surge. And in over here on, on in this section here, this is where we customize it for communities. Uh, for example, uh, in, in this section here under resources, I can go out and check the tide online, for example, or the Environment Canada's weather to say, say if the wind is high or if the, for example, that there, they, there may be dry conditions. Are we still all good? So, okay, awesome. So without further ado, um, I think I've talked about this here and I'm gonna go next. So now, this is silky smooth on mine, but I'm sharing it through Zoom. But this is a fairly large model and, and it's, it exists in 3D space. So I'm going to quickly zoom into wastewater treatment plant because that, and I'm going to uh, um, exit the pop up. This is where you can share additional information. But this model here, um, the, we had a storm about a year ago. I think it's pretty much a year ago, it was called Dorian and it had a, a storm surge that inundated this plant. Now I'm gonna show you what happened. I'm gonna show you a full tide, a full moon tide here. And um, it's 2.4 meters typically. So you can see that it, at high tide, it's getting close to the wastewater treatment plant. And it was a falling tide, but we had a meter storm surge. So very quickly, you can see that the a wastewater treatment plant got inundated with water. And it, what had happened, it shut down the operations. Uh, so what it did, uh, they were basically, unfortunately, the town was pumping raw sewage into the sheltered back harbor here. This is, a, a, this is called Front Harbor, and it's deep, but it, 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 it caused some environmental damage for, for the fish and the, and, the, and the wildlife. So they decided they had to figure this out. So now having said all of that, I'm gonna show you something. So we took, they had engineering studies that they had for years and that they hadn't actually implemented. Now we, we took that data and, and we're, we inputted it into this model and we'll play with this a little bit. I'm gonna pick the worst, uh, worst case situation from the engineering study. In 2100, they believe the sea level is going to rise by 1.77 meters. And I'm gonna pick a hundred year storm event, which we get every 10 years now and watch the water levels pop up here. So I'm gonna exit this and we're gonna play with this a little bit. This, I'm gonna zoom in here, but this is very interesting. You, these buildings here that we see, you can see that they exist in 3D space. The fire department, is at risk. The school, the Blue Nose Academy is risk. One of the employ, employment uh, uh, locations called uh, Lunenburg Foundry and Engineering and also ABCO is, uh, is inundated. The community centers uh, and, and the hockey rinks are all inundated. The, the place where the Red Cross might come in in an event like this, these, the baseball and fields and all that, they're all, they're all underwater. So also the sewer treatment plant is, uh, is basically underwater. And this is an old Mi'kmaq portage route because this is open ocean. There's 120 feet of water here and there's about 20 feet of water here. So the old people used to go in, take their, their canoes through here and, and, and go to the sheltered coves in all the islands in, in Back Harbor, depending on the weather. Well. If you go and see what this means, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit, that the town is almost an island. Now I'll also show you that you could go anywhere on this map and I'm gonna zoom, I'm gonna just show you that the fish plant, for example, is inundated and it's, it's gonna be shut down. I'm gonna to go to a fishing community uh, blue, called Blue Rocks on this map and I'll exit this here. But you can see the access roads and the islands, the shelter is gone. This road will be gone. Now you go, okay, Barry, that's really, that's really exciting. But that's, 
that's 80 years in the future. Well, and that's a hundred year storm event. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take us back to the wastewater treatment plant that started all this. And I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and I'm gonna show you what the real problem is because everybody thought because of the storm we had, it's sea sorry, it's storm surge. And so we have to plan for storm surge. Well, you can see the road is all covered here. You know, it's, it's bad news. Okay, so what I'm gonna do under the flooding scenarios, I'm gonna go and say, okay, let's, let's say sea level rise, a 2100, but a, a 10 year storm event, which we get every two years, we're having, a, we're having a storm here tomorrow. We're supposed to get three inches of rain. I, do, I don't think we're getting high winds, but there's Ida, which uh, what I mentioned about New Orleans is coming up our coast. So tomorrow's gonna be a storm. So it, it could be, you know, it could be a bad storm. So once again, I selected these two and I'm gonna hit simulate. Now, here's where you gotta watch really, really closely. Watch the water levels change. Now. So I'm going to hit simulate now. They hardly changed at all because sea level rise is the issue that the town has to worry about. It's not storm surge. Uh, storm surge can be handled by some simple things here in the, in the short term. And I'll show you this. I'll get rid of this. High tide and a storm surge in Back Harbor. Oh, I got two meters, one meter back down here, Barry. There we go. They're, they're, they've already changed based on, on our modeling. They're, they're putting one-way valves in the culverts because all this water comes under the culverts here where it drains the wetlands, where the old portage route. So in the short term, they, they have gone and um, they have uh, block the culvert so the, the flooding doesn't back up, but now they have to rethink everything about the town uh, because of sea level rise. So um, if everyone's okay, I'll, I'll just describe a little bit about, more about these buttons, and then I'll show you what you're all here for to see some fire, okay? So this is full screen mode. I click on that, self-explanatory goes full screen. I think you've seen me use these. You can go anywhere on the map that you want to, or you can pick these predefined areas by that, or even the pins. You can click on any of these pins and go in. So it's available both through this icon and the pins themselves. Now, what we have here is some of this is internal. Uh, some of it's outside links. If I click on uh, Lunenburg weather, for example, it will allow me to launch uh, a, a weather resource. And it's probably going to have a red banner up here. Yeah, there you go. Special weather statement because we're having a storm coming. Now, I, I'll click on this just to see, for example, if it's talking about uh, any types of uh, storm surges. No, just heavy rains, okay? But for example, that's here for this particular community. I'll get rid of that and I'll X this. So you can go out and you can, uh, sorry, you can go out and you can see the tides. There's different information. You can download guides to prepare for storms and uh, pl emergency planning and, there, and some of the, some of the uh, resources. So here's another thing, like say, if your community has, if, uh, has information it wants to share, it can share it through the resources or some of the pictures. Um, this, is, uh, this particular uh, is, uh, scene is a lighthouse. Uh, it had two families living on it. It was a farm it, and, and currently now it's all gone because of erosion. It's called Hobson's Island, but it doesn't exist. So that was something that they wanted to be shared. Uh, uh, what I find with other communities, they will share uh, pictures of like uh, of pl places where uh, 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 traditional uh, or graveyards are or, or traditional hunting sites, different things. Uh, you saw how this works. We can just turn the display pins on and off flooding scenarios. And here we can take a picture to be shared by email or Instagram or, or whatever you want. But if you click on that, it downloads a picture for you. So I'm going to... Um, Basically, I think I'll go back to the slideshow, but I'm going to leave you guys here and I'm going to go and find um, a new link and let's go look at fire. Okay. So when I click on this, are we seeing a midway uh, reserve coming up? Awesome. So this was the version, we did this for 
indigenous services, the EMAP people, they were all interested in doing flooding, but they said, we would really like to see if you could do fire. So we went and did an investigation and there is a, a, a formula for, for doing fire. It's called Byram's Fire Intensity. We implemented it in our model and we delivered it to, uh, to our communities and we showed it to Canadian Forestry Services and they were very, very impressed so much that they asked if, if we could work with them. So we're currently uh, working with them under a, a program to rigorize this, to incorporate their data for woodland inventory and their fire indexes. So this is the first version we created. And um, I'm gonna skip all of this stuff because you sort of went over that. And so I'm gonna show you, this is one of our early models. Uh, but I'm going to show you some other features here. So um, under here, you can put the, it's a tiny, tiny piece of land, and you'll see how small it is. It was a big reserve, and all it is is a bit of a wetland now. The, over the years, I think, I think we can all know about this, land gets taken away. So there is a band office here, and this in here is where the houses were being built. So I'm going to take that, um, the reserve land off, and I'm gonna play with the, the flooding levels. So you go, Barry, listen, it's not affecting that land. You've got, three, you've got almost 10 feet of water in that river. It seems to be fine. Well, it, and there it is. Okay, well, let's go and take the, the elevation of the trees off. So watch this, it, it is impacted. And where, where the houses are being built, they're at risk. So we can play with the elevation. Uh, we, we can, we can uh, if for example, we can take the, 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 the topography or write down the geotopography to show that what can happen even under the, the cloud of trees. So I'm gonna get rid of that. I'll get rid of the reserve land now and I'm gonna get rid of the flood and I'm gonna come over here. Now this was, I believe once reserve land but whether it's reserve land or not, if it catches fire and it blows the right way, it can cause damage to our band office here. Okay, so I'm going to go and select fire simulation. So in this particular version that we've delivered, you can play with the wind direction, the wind strength, dryness of the wood, simulation speed, and what, and you can set multiple fires. So I'm going to pick and drop a spot that I'm going to set a potential fire. Okay, now I'm going to show you, we, we can give control uh, for you for the wind direction. You can see that you can put the wind anywhere you want. Okay, and also uh, the wind strength, you see the arrow changes color and length. So uh, dryness, I'll show you that in practice. Now here on the south shore of Nova Scotia, the prevalent winds are from the Northwest. So this is a very good example. So I'm gonna start the fire and I'm gonna play with the wind strength and direction to show you how this all works. This is based on, on science and math. Uh, we've made some assumptions. I, I said when looking at the picture that this was mature fur, but we, uh, based on the work we're doing with the Canadian Forestry Service, it, we can pick up that whether it's birch, uh, thin grassland, all of that, that will all be in, in uh, automatically put in the, into the community models. So I'm going to click start. So um, it's going to start a fire and I'm going to, I'm going to play with the dryness, just show you if I make it really dry, it starts to burn really quick, but I'm gonna take the dryness down. So it's maybe in the spring and you can see how it slows down, but I'm gonna pick up the wind strength, okay? Even though it's wetter, it's still taking on. Now, what it's doing, and you can see that the, it's still wet, but it's, it's moving to the, north, uh, to the southeast. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring the wind strength down. Um, no, I'm gonna bring the dryness up. So it's gonna start, you see how the intensity of the flames? Now it preheats the next cell. So I'm gonna take the wind strength down, but it's still gonna take off because it built a, a bit of wind on its own. You see how quickly it's still going? Because the, the heat of itself, of the fire itself has dried out the, the woodland. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this wet to try to slow this down to simulate bombers. Okay, so we have that there. Now you go and you say, oh, well, that's all great, Barry. So let's, 
see if you can control. Let's go and change it and make it go to the south. And I'm going to pick up wind strength. So if the wind changes, look at this, it's starting to go southward. It's still creeping towards the, the east, but it's predominantly being driven by the wind. So we've had this reviewed by climate scientists and they say it's accurate, it's realistic, and it's being, um, it's being vetted and, and verified in detail with them. So I'm going to hit pause. So any questions? No, no questions? Oh, I don't believe it. Okay. <laughs> well, that's our fire model. Now I want to talk about that. Um, if in a community you have, like, if you're on the side of a hill or very hilly, this fire model will take in, in, in into account the elevation. Now, I, um, I have been around a few fire, uh, forest fires, but not as much as most the people may be watching this, but uh, it, the fire will go up a hill very quickly because it feeds itself. Going down, it will slow down. So that our model takes that into account. So for example, this is fairly flat. Uh, if there was a large hill here, you would see it accelerate up the hill. And then depending on the wind and the way, or sorry, the wind and the direction, it, it would burn down slow. So it's not just, it's not a game. It's based on science, based on math, and then incorporated on, on, on a correct digital elevation model. So for, and it's customized for your community. So what, what I've been finding is people have been running scenarios about fire breaks, uh, whether to show how fire breaks may work, to that that you may have to thin out or do some, you know, some of the old ways of of of, of the natural burns and burn, you know, thinning the land around the reserves. This can show it with and without, depending on on what the application is, how effective those may work. Um, I we've done that for living shorelines where people are changing the shoreline so their towns don't. We can show how what would happen with a certain water level uh, with and without a mi a mitigation and adaptation. So this, for example, could be used for training for community members or showing why you may need to go and put in a fire break or to thin out the land to slow it down. Uh, um, I, um, I've shown it to a, a few people and they use it for, I think they refer to it as tabletop uh, training. So um, if Michelle, if you'd like to uh say if you're okay should i continue to the end of the uh of the powerpoint and, and then we're good okay awesome so i'm going to stop sharing my screen i'm going to um come back to the i'm going to share my screen but i'm going to pick the uh the powerpoint so um we have looked at some of the demos. Uh, there's a there's a living shoreline demo in which we we allow the user to drop in the 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 planned mitigation to help save the town, uh, but I won't I don't need to show that because you get an idea of what we can do. Uh, I'm going to go to the next slide. So we're uh, you probably saw that we're working with uh, virtual reality. This can be used in uh, in a virtual reality headset. We, we're doing it theoretical. No, none of our customers have ever asked for it. I think I've mentioned that we're working with Natural Resources uh, uh, Prometheus Fire Modeling Department. And we're currently working with Canada's Ocean Supercluster Project doing um, uh, visualizations for wind and wave and tidal. And, uh, and we're working with, I guess, since you guys are in the, on the uh, West Coast, we're working with the uh, University of Victoria and the primed group, which they're looking into alternative energy sources for First Nation, coastal First Nation communities. Okay, so now there's some links. Uh, we've been, we've been uh, very pleased to be uh, interviewed by CBC uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Uh, we've been on the radio a little bit, but uh, it's raising awareness. I can set, uh, I believe I've already shared the, the PowerPoint if someone wants it. Uh, they can go to Michelle and get it, or if you've got my email address, I can send it to you. Um, but we've been in the news a little bit. Like I said, this is pretty small, uh, but we've we've done some interesting things. And so a few testimonials. So the town of Mahone Bay, based on, on what we've done, they've sought funding and they're putting in a pilot project. The town of Lunenburg that I mentioned, uh, they, they've changed their, their, their drainage system. Um, 
I've worked, uh, this is with some of the scientists I've worked with, and this is another Mi'kmaq person, uh, a, a good friend of mine who did some work up on the St. John River, where 100 year floods are actually 10 meters, 10 meters, 33 feet. And we've done some of that modeling because guess where our first nation communities are on the banks, on the low lying areas. So we've got some issues to look at and to think about. So our website, 3dwavedesign.com, um, observe, plan, adapt. That's what we're all about. And uh, here we are. So uh, will I end? Thank you very much. And I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen and hopefully somebody will talk to me. Thank you, Barry. Um, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I, I just, I, I'm always amazed at the gifts that creators given, you know, to, to people. And so you're a genius. You partnered with your son to create this model. Like how mm -hmm. fantastic. So if people wanted to access your tool, your resource, that would be like First Nations, that would be organizations. Um, so then they would just check out the website, they'd come to you, reach out to you. Uh, then you would go to their community or how, how does that work? Well, we've done both. Now, like, you know, obviously when people contact us, now we've done, we're doing some work because of COVID, we're not traveling as much, but we're, we're doing modeling for uh, Newfoundland, Con River. And we did it all virtually. They told me what, what, they want it done. I write up a proposal and they review it. They 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 sign a contract for us to do it because it costs money or they have to seek funding. And we because the lidar now the lidar exists for a lot of locations and a lot of it's public. So we can literally we we didn't have to go to Newfoundland. We downloaded the lidar from the the province of Newfoundland. We create the model. We give it back to them and they and we say, are you happy? Do you have pictures? Uh, do you have documents? And they give that to us, we put it in, and then we do just like this, a virtual presentation. Now, I mean, I'd love to go to every First Nation community, but but uh, right now we're, we're, you know, we have COVID. It's very simple and cost effective. We do everything virtually. And the deliverable, it, we give you a link, you can download it or we can host it for you. And, um, and, and it's as good, I want to say, as the people that are supplying the information, the extra content. Because I tell you, it's so great when I see some communities show a swollen river, right? Like back in 1937, it was this high. We, you know, this isn't something we're making up. This has happened before. And, and this now in, now in 2021, if it happens, we happen to have some houses there, which we didn't have before. So we have to either raise them or put a burn around them to protect them. But for us to do nothing is not really an option. And uh, especially for some of the places that I've dealt with, um, indigenous communities, the water treatment facilities are on the lake and they're close to the lake and those lakes flood. And if the lakes flood, then the water treatment plants no longer work. Or it's the same with the sewer treatment plants. We've got to make sure that those are protected. So the thing is, we got to identify in our communities so we don't become have to boil water for another hundred years. <laughs> you know, we have to identify the stuff and fix it before it gets bad. Wow, yeah. remarkable, remarkable what you have created. Um, talk about prevention and and offering a solution. You know, to the the big issues that are out there. You know, because our climate is changing. I mean even here in Edmonton, like this was the hottest summer that we've experienced, you know, so, and it's only gonna, things are only gonna get changed, are only going to change more and more. And so I think it's important to have tools like this and resources, you know, so that we can um, look ahead and we can put in those measures that we need to. So I am blown away by your genius. Um, uh, no, no, it's, <laughs> it's just, it, it, it's it's having the abilities and, and realizing that there's a need and working. It's a lot of hard work and, and it can be very frustrating, but it's something that we need to do, right? So, you know, the thing about all of this, I'm really hoping that people see this because the communities that have, when they're ready and they show the community or they show the funding agencies, it's almost negligent if you don't do something because 
this is this is safety and security of, of our communities, right? So, like some people say, well, it's you know you're, you're you're not giving us any hope. I'm giving you all kinds of hope, because if you know what could happen, you have the ability to observe, plan, and adapt. And so, if you know that, if, for example, this place could flood, you either have to raise it up, or you have to protect it, or you have to move it. We don't want to have a band office or a hospital or a medical center be wiped out because we didn't think that this was wasn't going to happen. It's going to happen. It's not. It's eventually. It's it's not if. It's when. Especially with sea level rise, right, and fires, right. You know. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, I love the observe, plan, adapt. I love that you captured that well. Thank you for sharing with us this afternoon. Well, where you are, it's in the evening time. Um, but thank you so much, Barry. Uh, you know, say hi to the land for me out there. It's my favorite place ever. Uh, yeah. So have have a good rest of the evening. Yeah. And thank you all for joining us. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you for your valuable time and information. Well, hi, thank hi. you. Thank you very much. And uh, have a good one. It was a pleasure as always. Okay. Okay. Peace. Thank you.